All right, we might start, Elizabeth. I'll turn that. Right. Music off. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for coming along to the Dementia Knowledge Network for August now. Can't believe it. Um, so first, I'll just do a little acknowledgement of country, and then I'll throw over to Sarah to introduce our uh, guest speaker for today. So our meeting is being held on the lands of the Wurundjeri people um, of the Kulin Nation, and I wish to acknowledge them as traditional owners of the land. I would also like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Our speaker today is Kate Ellen Elliott. Kate Ellen is a senior lecturer at the University of Tasmania and a registered clinical psychologist. Her area of practice and research is, on, is in psychogeriatrics, particularly older adults' physiological adjustment to health conditions. Kate today is going to talk to us about um, research on capacity and resilience and building strategies for the aged and the dementia care workforce. Thanks very much, Kate. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks very much for that introduction. I'll um, get my screen up and share some slides that I've put together for us to have a look at today. Um, <clears throat> just bear with me while I work all that out. And I want you to be able to see. I think it would be the screen. Let's see. What can you see now? Can we press? Just the zoom, just, just the, the normal zoom. zoom. There we go. So, so what can you see now? Is that um, the slides or can you see the presenter view? We can see I'm... the presenter view. Okay, let's see if I can. Um, work out how to get you onto the main screen sorry that's all right that's such a Maybe trap when you're trying to use two screens it is Does it work like that is that better they're perfect oh, okay it's not quite what i wanted but anyway <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. So thank you so much for um, having me along to the uh, Dimension Knowledge Network today. It's been, um, I've been really looking forward to the opportunity to come and meet with you all and talk a bit about some of our research. Um, you can see uh, at the beginning here of this slide, there's a, a picture which is um, the building where we work um, in, um, in Hobart in Tasmania. Um, and uh, I'll also um, tell you a bit more about where I'm coming from as well as we work through today. But yes, uh, as Sarah mentioned, um, that the talk that what I'll be talking about is about capacity and resilience building strategies for the age and dementia care workforce. Um, in particular, a bit about um, some of the research that we've been doing in this space. Um, it's um, trying not to be too researchy and really kind of going to try and glean over some of the um, and pull out the key messages from some of the work that we've been doing and what that's kind of culminated in um, developing a particular program that um, we've been working on and closely with um, a range of collaborators as well. So um, I'll move on to our next slide. So I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the traditional custodians of the lands on where I live and work, and that's the Palawa people, and pay my respects to their elders uh, past and present. And I feel honoured to share the beauty of the mountains, beaches and water that flows through and around Latruwita uh, and appreciate the long history and culture of the island and its people. And I also reckon, uh, recognise the tremendous strength and resilience of the Palawa people and support a future where Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families and communities are valued and respected. So a little bit about um, where I've been working um, at um, the Wiki Dementia Research and Education Centre is that um, I just really like to acknowledge the generosity and foresight of the um, philanthropist John and Janet Wicking, who played a really pivotal role in establishing the centre uh, back in 2008. Uh, and, you know, we kind of recognise and honour that contribution um, by including their name in the title of the centre. And, um, you know, they have pledged almost eight million to support the, the uh, ongoing nature of the centre as well. So it's, um, I want to say thank you. Um, and recognise um, perhaps that's, you haven't heard that's where the names come from. So the centre is um, 
a multidisciplinary um, group and we're a bunch of researchers and educators and practitioners and so uh, the mission is to transform the understanding of dementia worldwide and positively influence aged um, and healthcare policies and cre creating dementia friendly communities and there's a range of ways that this is done and there are some, like, three kind of key themes um, that we work across uh, firstly around preventing dementia uh, secondly about understanding the cause of dementia and thirdly around the care of people with dementia or people affected by dementia family members um, and the workforce as well so this is just acknowledging um, you know the kind of diverse range of people who uh, work within the center so having that interdisciplinary focus from neuroscience and medicine and nursing sociology and psychology you know policy and allied health as well so um, there's a real mix of uh, people at the centre and we um, really have an opportunity to be able to share in quite a um, varied uh, way of working and that's what's kind of quite unique and interesting in this space. Um, I have, you know, being a clinical psychologist, often I'm not necessarily up in the labs um, and doing those for work um, that is done in that kind of um, biomedical space but um, I have um, in my day I have also um, been in workshops where I've trained to extract DNA from a strawberry so you know there are amazing things that we can kind of do and learn about from each other just by being uh, together in this uh, in this way. So one of, we have a range of programs a lot of people um, would be aware of and may have um, that's how they kind of first come in contact with the working centre is uh, looking at some of our education offerings and so we offer a range of uh, massive open online courses and the um, current and most recent one is around um, traumatic brain injury and so enrolments are open for that so it's a little bit of a, a plug to say uh, you know, if you haven't done that one have a look and pass on the message of um, some really interesting um, uh, people who are involved in um, talking about the current research in that space and you know the impacts it has on, on people who are affected by brain injury uh, and this is just a slide around the contents of the um, one of the common, uh, the first course that we did and uh, about understanding dementia and, and looking at um, the way that that's structured in those kind of three key areas around understanding, you know, that dementia is a condition of the brain uh, and then looking closely at um, what the disease is and symptoms of the condition and then uh, finally bringing it all together by looking at it from that person uh, perspective. So um, yeah, there's... Uh, people often are really uh, encouraging of their experience of this course and of course being online it means it's helpful um, easy to kind of access and um, and engage with so it's um it's delivered twice a year and just uh, it's, uh, goes over seven weeks so I'm in the position now where I've um, kind of transitioned from working um for most of my time at the Wiki Dementia Centre and now I've moved across to um, the School of Psychological Sciences at the University of Tasmania and this has been um, a really um, uh, great timing in terms of uh, some of the research we've been doing and uh, my um, focus on teaching um, in terms of working with older adults and older adult mental health in particular. So um, uh, it's, it will be really interesting to see um, some of the programs that we're currently developing at the moment. We're having a new focus on um, our postgraduate programs in psychology, particularly um, looking at um, ways to update and, and look at um, running this really great blended delivering um, of the uh, program. So, um, so my experience has been mainly online, and so it's really good to be able to look at how we can develop and deliver some of these this training. Um, and courses online and also um, we have that's blended with some um, really great skills workshops as well um, in that space so so um, yeah my teaching now is really focused on delivering um, programs for um, our future generations of psychologists and counsellors as well and so one of the uh, areas that I'm involved in is working in the university psychology clinic and this is run as a service to um, our local community here um, where uh, people can come and access psychological services um, from our, our provisional psychologists who are supervised by clinical psychologists and they can offer services um, in areas of um, mental health across a range of um, individual and um, uh, therapy programs and assessments as well. So um, we uh, have been expanding our programs and really that's because there is just such a great need in our community at the moment for um, for mental health uh, and our workforce in mental health, uh, much like aged care is uh, really um, 
um, under a lot of um, demands and so we're looking to grow it. So this is just a, um, a snip from our local paper up in Launceston, the examiner about um, the clinic that's just opened up there and some of our um, wonderful staff that are running that as well. And so, you know, and this, the stats on the side are from um, the Australian Psychological Society's uh, recent uh, survey into their uh, members around, uh, you know, some of the challenges that psychologists are facing. So, you know, one in three are unable to see new clients. Um, that's up from one in five from June in um, 2021. And prior to that pandemic, um, you know, only um, one in a hundred psychologists were taking on um, new clients. So there is this really big change um, associated with um, the pandemic and big changes that everyone's facing in our community where uh, psychologists are needed. And, and I'll come back to kind of the, the blending of the role of psychology um, in um, building capacity and resilience of that aged care workforce as well um, towards the end of our chat today in my talk. We'll get to chat at the end where we'll be having questions at the end. So this is just um, a slide which I'm sure you're, you're really actually all well aware of this because this is something that is just so really current in our news now, isn't it? It's um, you know, uh, our workforce in Australia for that are delivering services to older people, uh, particularly in uh, residential aged care and uh, community care settings, uh, you know, it's just not growing fast enough. It is growing, but just not fast enough, um, particularly to match, you know, the quite a wide variety of needs and preferences and also our expectations of the ageing population. Um, you know, we need this threefold increase in care workers in Australia to, to meet uh, the care needs of uh, those people over the next three decades. And there's some been some newer reports that um, have, have estimated that, in fact, uh, we're, there are shortages from 30,000 to 35,000 a year of aged care workers. Uh, and so it's a really big challenge that um, we're facing at the moment. And, um, you know, even it's been just, just so much more um, challenging during the pandemic. So when we think about the, the kind of characteristics of this workforce as well, it comprises mostly women uh, and over the ages of 45, and um, they're mostly in part-time roles, and sometimes um, from lower socioeconomic groups as well, and uh, you know, approximately one third um, from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. So uh, it's really important to have a good understanding of this group. So we're you know trying to look at ways to um, kind of solve some of the challenges that this group is facing as well. It's not to say that, um, you know, there are people from, you know, uh, other characteristics of, you know, profiles as well, but that's just thinking about it from that kind of overall um, majority view. So, you know, the challenges that have been faced are really around these uh, human resourcing problems, issues with recruitment and turnover, and, and we know that that really does influence uh, care outcomes. You know, there's the, the, um, the recent Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety, um, we highlighted that again and, you know, it's just uh, ongoing with some of the challenges that are being faced. And so often the reports as well um, and uh, research papers recognise that there are gaps in access to continuing professional education, training and also uh, workplace support for um, people who are working in these areas. So, um, you know, I think that what does this mean? That means that, you know, Now's the time to act, isn't it? We really need to start looking at ways to, um, what are some kind of um, unique ways or um, looking at this problem and some areas that we can solve. And, and we need to try and do it in a way that's um, as effective as it can be, considering the circumstances and what kind of evidence is there to support particular approaches. So that's what we're kind of um, really looking at is trying to focus on some particular ways of going about um, maybe providing some solutions to this this challenge or part of part of this challenge that we're experiencing in this sector. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a program of work which um, I've been leading, which has been has led to the development of a program called uh, Work for Dementia. And so we've um, been really fortunate uh, in the funding that has been provided to support this program. Um, and it's earlier than what's even um, I've provided here on this screen because if we think about um, it's kind of stemmed from some ideas from my PhD, which is a long time ago now, but, you know, that was supported by a scholarship, uh, you know, and that 
kind of led into some, um, you know, early career uh, funding from the University of Tasmania and then the C grant from Wiking and then, you know, very fortunate to um, receive the development fellowship from the NHMRC and the ARC to focus on extending that research and, and really focusing on, you know, how we can uh, translate some of that or into um, you know, practical you know, strategies that um, can impact on, on these kind of issues. Uh, so I think, you know, that really shows that there's um, a lot of um, support for, for change in this space. So here's a, um, a list of some of those, you know, our main contributors to the development of the program. Uh, and, um, you know, I'd particularly like to thank um, just to the research side of the program um, in particular and um, Dr. Laura Tierney, who um, was um, unable to make it today. I'd really like to say a big thank you to her and, and, and especially her contributions in um, being a, a program um, manager, project manager, sorry, throughout um, this development phase and the pilot as well. So, um, so these are the kind of four areas that I'd really like to um, cover today in the research that we've conducted that informs the development of the program. So firstly, it's looking at, uh, you know, understanding dementia and the nature of um, care work in particular. Uh, secondly, looking at uh, the care workforce from a, a view of their health and wellbeing. Then focusing on uh, turnover and relationships at work, so um, and turnover intentions, and then um, looking um, at workforce and workplace development programs. So previous ones that have uh, um, been published in the academic literature in particular. So when we think about um, the background to the development of work for dementia, what we've really done here was we've been um, focusing on research that aims to build capacity and resilience. Um, and that's trying to aim to help us answer, you know, which strategies might help um, change and these kind of key areas. So firstly, uh, things that might reduce job stress, um, things that might, uh, so which strategies might enhance worker engagement and, and positivity in their jobs. Um, uh, I think what's strategies might reduce our intention to leave and turnover, uh, and also, um, you know, are there flow on effects for um, improvements in quality of care? So this is uh, really what we're kind of thinking about when we're designing it, but also thinking about, you know, what would, when we're coming to pilot the program as well, what we're wanting to look at. So I'm kind of throwing around a few key terms here, which um, can be considered a bit woolly. So, you know, I thought I should take an opportunity to just define what, what I mean by um, capacity when I'm talking about that. So here in this context, uh, really capacity relates to the abilities of an organisation to uh, be able to provide and, and maintain services. Uh, so at that organisational level, but it also uh, can be at that yeah, worker level, you know, where we're looking at uh, an individual's ability to absorb uh, skill or knowledge. And really there's this kind of desired outcome is to meet um, a, you know, particular demand or standards. So uh, that's around, you know, quality care. And then when we talk about resilience, well, what do we mean when we uh, mention this word? I think we all have our own understanding of what resilience is. And really it refers to the, you know, ability to cope and thrive. And, and you might have heard of that, um, you know, that idea of uh, when someone experiences an adverse event and they go bounce back and, and perhaps even, um, you know, um, have a, an experience of, I'm learning from that or growing from that person as well. And so in this context, you know, we think um, resilience, we're applying it to the emotional demands of um, the job. And, um, and that can kind of occur at, again, this individual level, uh, but also um, at a group, group level within teams too, so. And if we think about now some of the work that I'm about to kind of present, this have really been from a range of perspectives. We've been, um, our participants and collaborators have been um, mainly aged care employees and managers. And so from a real, a real range of settings. So, you know, nurses and allied health, um, assistants in nursing care, assistants, personal carers, pastoral carers, you know, measure and lifestyle officers. And there are just so many different um, job titles and job roles across these um, when we talk about um, dementia care workers. That's just a really kind of made up term to try and capture everyone in it. But it is um, really important to recognise those um, kind of range of roles there. And we've tried to kind of capture that in some of um, our recruitment participants in this um, in the research that we've done as well. And so um, we've also um, 
been very fortunate to uh, have family members involved in our um, program and our research and also including um, people who partner with older people, um, might be friends or family, but also including people with dementia um, who uh, are um, receiving a service in Australia and, and also some of our um, surveys have reached uh, international um, participants as well, so based um, in other parts of the world. So we've got a pretty good number of people that have taken part in our research over the years. And um, this we've, we've done other things that kind of inform the way we go about some of the research and the topics that we do as well. And But that's not really included here. You know, we've done other things in terms of you know, workshops or community engagement activities where, you know, um, you're just able to go and meet with people in, in the sector and, um, and, and um, or deliver training or, you know, you can't kind of help yourself talk about some of these um, these challenges and these issues. So we kind of receive a lot of information um, when, when people find out that we're interested in, this, in different ways as well. So, um, so again, looking at our research approach, so what type of methods we've been using um, to look at and develop the Work for Dementia program, we've looked at really um, quite various methods um, and tried to investigate uh, and examine the level of evidence on workforce development interventions in this space. So. We've uh, conducted interviews, uh, we've conducted surveys uh, that have mostly been online. Um, we've also run focus groups and we've also spent time, um, you know, really working systematically through the literature to conduct reviews of, you know, existing papers and, and their findings on, um, on uh, programs that are aimed at uh, educating and uh, building capacity and resilience in this workforce. And so um, I've just got a brief comment there about, you know, some of those um, types of analysis that we've done as well in terms of that kind of uh, line up with those into those uh, methods and really you know the reason we've been interested in having that variety of methods is because we've been kind of asking a few different questions along the way and so that dictates what method you would apply. <clears throat> so again just a reminder of some of those topics that we're going to now work our way through um, uh, that we have informed the program. But really before we get to get to this, I'd also like to acknowledge that we've spent quite a bit of time looking at theories that inform the research and the, our approach to the research as well. And most of those really stem from um, social and organisational psychological theories around um, that are really relevant for this space. And, and so one area um, where we have published around um, the, those theories have been in a book chapter, um, which has uh, focused on some particular theories looking at um, one around um, job demands and resources. And that's really when, um, you know, the job demands are outweighed by the resources that are available. And that can result in um, feelings of depersonalisation and burnout. So that's kind of one of, one of those um, Theories that have kind of um, been we've been applying to the work we've been doing. There's another around perceived organisational support, and this theory is really that you know if you feel that um, your your organisation um, supports you and is there for you and is going to um, kind of is ready to kind of back uh, fight for you and you know is on your side, you're you're willing to put in an effort and go above and beyond for your organisation. So it's kind of um, that explains that one a little bit. There's there's um, a theory around occupational communion, and this is something that is something we've um, this kind of got, came easily came from my PhD. And we've done some work in looking at how to measure this now, and we've decided that it's um, uh, really about a sense of belonging based on social connections at work, and um, it's essential for positive coping in care workers. And so um, we can talk a bit more about that later on too. That will come up as well. And another one around psychological capital. So psychological capital really is um, something that's been around for a while too, and it's kind of an amalgamation of kind of key constructs in this space. Um, you know, and, and it's but overall it's defined as an individual's positive psychological state of development and so those kind of key concepts um, make up the acronym of HERO uh, so it's of uh, hope, self-efficacy, resilience and optimism are those kind of key um, areas in that so so if you're interested um, to kind of dive into some of that theory that's um, kind of written a little bit about that in, that in that chapter as well but moving on to those topics again so our first topic is looking at you know understanding and in dementia and the nature of care work. So, you know, early on, you know, this is one of our first studies looking at, you know, 
who look at different perspectives of people who um, are engaged with people with dementia and, and what do they know and, and um, we wanted to find out about kind of their level of knowledge. So here we've got perspectives from nurses and care workers and family members and um, we're also interested at this stage to kind of look at how we might actually measure knowledge. So um, kind of beyond this we did some uh, further studies on um, dementia knowledge and how to assess it but I'm not going to talk about that too much today instead. So the, the findings really from this kind of recognise that um, that there are real gaps in dementia knowledge, you know, um, which workers and family members have recognised and they really wanted to reduce those. So it's, it's um, something that, you know, can be quite a motivating space to start in a way. We also looked closely at the nature of care work uh, from the perspective of family members. So this is a paper where we looked at um, their ideas about um, services and ways they might enhance them and also this level of satisfaction with services too. So, um, and we conduct, conducted here a mixed method study. So it was interviews um, and also um, some um, ratings on surveys as, as well, sorry. Where did we get to? And so one of the key findings from here is really, again, you know, the family members um, wanted workers um, to not just have better knowledge, but be able to relate better to the person with dementia. So some of those interactions, um, they were, you know, particularly early on in the relationship. Um, sometimes it was a bit more challenging and, um, you know, things might kind of, as they get to know the person, be easier, but they kind of still felt that it would be, you know, that relationship was really very important and, and that could be um, enhanced um, by, uh, um, by, by different ways. So, and um, we're kind of, at this stage, we're thinking here about, um, you know, this idea of uh, co-production and looking at the research around, um, you know, if you're trying to design a service or an intervention or a program um, and it's intended for a particular group, that group really needs to be able to contribute to and have an understanding and a say. I mean, you need to know that group very, very well and they need to be a part of, um, you know, what that might look like. So it's kind of looking at making sure, you know, if you follow a particular approach with this co-production design um, where um, you include people who um, are potentially on the receiving end of what it is you're designing, um, then that, that there's potentially a greater um, uh, application or a greater, it's going to meet, more likely to meet their needs is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> And so a little bit more about the nature of care work. So here um, we talk, um, describe a little bit more about occupational communion, but really we were looking um, at uh, finding out about what the uh, community-based care workers were, um, their experiences and opinions of their uh, job roles and things that impacted on their work experiences. So, um, and we found uh, that um, care work is very, it has this interpersonal nature and it is emotionally demanding. And there were kind of various examples of that. And one of those is looking at um, the levels of grief and loss that workers experience at watching their clients uh, change and, um, and go um, particularly towards their last years of life. And so that was quite uh, considered to be emotionally demanding from the care worker's perspective. And uh, and then we looked, the, the other kind of key message from this was around how um, those workers were feeling quite undervalued in the jobs that they were completing and that they were feeling quite isolated from each other. So these workers, uh, people who were going into the home to deliver the care and, um, and also, uh, you know, the workplace supports um, perhaps weren't um, as uh, available as, as they would like. And also uh, they kind of felt um, that isolation wasn't just kind of from each other, but it was kind of from the broader health sector as well. So um, there's some further work we've done on that as, as well. So um, continuing on, so with that nature of care work, um, looking at what the job roles were of the uh, care workers. So um, they were talking about, um, you know, some of the demands of the job is that we, they were required to uh, constantly be aware of changes um, in their clients and that kind of um, and kind of continual changes, sorry, to the um, workplace and the setting that they're in as well. And uh, so that kind of limited their sense of control at work as well to uh, 
you need to be adapting um, uh, um, quite often. And something that was um, very meaningful for these workers, um, uh, you know, amidst all those challenges we've kind of talked about, were the close relationships that they had with the people they're providing care for. And so that close relationship was, was really um, something that was they felt um, was essential to help them cope positively with their job roles. Um, and so we've described that as uh, occupational communion. And communion is a, is, um, a term that um, is a social psychological construct and um, it had, comes with lots of connotations around it, but generally it's this uh, kind of sense of being others focused and kind of your drive in life is um, to really uh, put others first um, before yourself and, you know, that's, that's what, what motivates you in life the most. And so we've applied it to the occupational setting. <clears throat> So further, further on, we're still going on about the nature of care work. Uh, and here we're looking more closely at nurses and, um, and what factors might influence the management of care services by nurses. And we're particularly interested in um, the, this is some work around the psychosocial work characteristics. Um, and when we talk about the psychosocial work environment, you know, it's quite distinctive from the physical environment when, um, you know, which is kind of more about manual tasks and, uh, you know, buildings and whether you have to walk upstairs and all those kind of things or using um, lift machines, you know, um, uh, you know, so the psychosocial work environment is really those that can be individual, so those um, in individual kind of psychological aspects or um, that kind of groups of social um, variables that are involved in that. So, you know, when we think of um, organizational climate um, uh, you know and or the kind of culture of the organization or it might be actually um, the employees attitudes and their own values um, and it could also be about the way uh, the kind of work roles that people undertake and the design of them and um, you know the content of the tasks you know that whether they're meaningful or not or repetitive and um, that kind of thing and so we recognize that so, you know, uh, from previous literature, that's kind of can influence health and well-being. And so when we looked um, at this uh, group of aged care nurses, we recognised that, um, you know, if we target job control, uh, this might actually be one of the biggest responses for nurse managers in care because it's really likely to have this kind of overall effect on job satisfaction, psychological distress and depression so you know um you know there's these implications that if you're able to support or find ways where workers can have better control over their jobs you know there can be these violent effects for improving well-being at work and so we continued on um, a bit later uh, with a um this is a a cross-sectional study, uh, a, a smaller study, and it's a mixed methods. And here we're looking at information from self-report um, on a range of questionnaires, um, looking at um, health and well-being of the uh, care workforce and um, of this group of carers, and looking kind of wanting to know a bit about what they thought about the best and worst parts of parts of their job work, and. Um, and when we kind of put the data together, it came to and looking at kind of how they coped and adjusted with their jobs. Uh, overall, um, you know, when you looked at the kind of group at an overall level, they really did seem to be quite a resilient group. Um, but then there were like this smaller group where um, a smaller proportion of the um, this group that did experience psychological distress, and that was quite to, you know quite high levels. So we could even say that distress was. So it was only one time, but if, if that was kind of ongoing, it might even be um, equivalent to a mental illness. So, um, that, so that was something that um, was, um, it kind of fits fits generally with um, how, how we cope um, broadly um, across the population. Um, but it was kind of interesting to start to um, look at all oh, what, what, what might be going on and why might that be the case. And so we have some further um, work as well, which um, is currently under review, looking at um, what we've talked about as the precarious resilience of the aged care workforce 
And these are particularly from participants who are enrolled in um, the Australian Online Dementia course. Uh, and so we were really interested again to see if that kind of study we looked at previously in that smaller group, if on a larger scale, so here this um, is 662 with the, with the number of participants that um, undertook the survey, um, to see if there were kind of a similar uh, pattern in, in the result in their mental health and well-being. And so we found here that um, you know again care workers kind of overall have this um, reasonably positive um, adjustment or positive profile but when you look kind of closely there were some things that um, you know there could be areas for improvement and so um, they have higher than national averages for some health risk factors so um, obesity and, and mental health were um, risk factors in there and, and also we were able to um, survey and ask about, well, uh, you know, what is it that your workplace um, that you have as uh, an amenity? You know, what is it that is it about your workplace that can support your health and well-being? And so, um, we found some gaps in in some of those amenities as well. So things like um, um, things like you know having a, a regular um, space to have your lunch, you know, uh, lunch space, or um, things like um, you know being having access to um, uh, work, workforce wellbeing programs or um, even access to um, um, uh, things like uh, immunisation and those kind of things. So, um, and so we were kind of, we also were fortunate to um, collect some data on some work uh, from um, another group of um, aged care work workers around um, the health and well-being, but particularly during the time of the pandemic. And so um, because the work I just presented before was prior to that. And um, so this has um, just recently been accepted for publication. So, uh, and this is a paper that Laura has led. So um, it would have been lovely for her to be here to talk about this, but um, she is on leave, so that's okay. Uh, we, but so the title of this paper was kind of a play on some of the, you know, the um, the four Ds of, uh, you know, dementia, delirium, depression and drugs. And you often see that in those training programs targeting um, care, uh, the care workforce. But here the study found that the four Ds that uh, summarise the experience of aged care workers was distressed, feeling detached and devalued, but determined. And so, um, you know, we came across this data because it was really quite um for children that um, the workers just uh, kind of talked about um, their pandemic experience. And so we kind of separated this from another study of, um, that we're looking at about designing the pro program at the time and um, looked closely at this data because we realised that, um, you know, it was quite unique at the time. And so one of the things, um, you know, we, that we found from this work was that, you know, um, the messages that we're hearing, you know, uh, um, were quite true. You know, there's these intensified procedures, and again, these emotionally demanding roles that um, have become kind of um, even more so. So, the challenge of um, uh, when when uh, family members are unable to um, potentially come into, say, the residential aged care facility to see um, their uh, loved ones, you know, that's a, the care workers are trying to work out how to support them, dealing with that and connecting them, um, and uh, amidst all sorts of other challenges of um, the uh, testing around um, COVID and um, all the kind of issues of uh, challenges around. Um, uh, meeting those requirements to be uh, COVID safe as much as they can. And so um, because, you know, we, we kind of recognise and know that um, the, the experience of COVID is really uh, something that is disproportionately affecting older people. And um, and so and particularly um, there's high rates in aged care um, and there's kind of more severe illness and, uh, and death as well. So and it's kind of more wide. So what's going on to challenge, to cope and manage with this and prevent um, the kind of control and spread of the virus. So we're kind of seeing about, you know, we recognise that's something that was already known, but what was this um, response uh, from the workers to this? And really we've kind of, what we've added here is about that increased, increased um, workloads and intensity of their jobs. Uh, this, uh, this sense of, again, feeling undervalued, 
um, and detached from the front line. So there was this real sense of uh, when uh, you know, there were um, thinking international you know, was claps for the NHS, or you know, we were all really um, giving copies to um, to nurses and really supporting the efforts that um, early on uh, and aged care workers instead were still going through the Royal Commission and um, were just feeling so much shame about their jobs and um, and really um, just not not perceived in that way by um, community um, leaders and in the media as well. So they really did feel detached from that frontline effort despite the fact that they were doing things like, um, um, you know, saying, well, let's not take on agency staff. We'll just have to do a bit more effort. You know, we're not gonna, uh, in those kind of times before there were um, regulations around that. So um, again, you know, it's just kind of exposed, all their experience just exposed the systems deficiencies in the, the, the system deficiencies already that were there, they've kind of just become heightened. Um, but some, you know, despite all those challenges, there were some real uh, quite interesting insights about recognising that um, the importance of teamwork and working together and um, and um, being able to support each other during this time. So that was something that um, they really kind of acknowledged that was, um, you know, while that could be um, something that was beneficial if their workplace was doing that and wanting more of that too. So some um, um, workers reported that they, in fact, um, yeah, they had more regular team meetings because they had to, um, and they were doing that online, just like we are now. And, you know, and like we all have adjusted to that. So there was this other uh, kind of um, space that recognised that um, they've all um, felt much more confident using um, technology and particularly in these kind of online space, online resources. So uh, moving on to our topic around uh, turnover and relationships at work. So if we kind of remember we've got, we're getting to, this is our third topic now, so we're getting through them. This one um, is really talking a bit about um, um, a presentation that we um, uh, gave um, at the Australian Dementia Research Forum in Hobart uh, a couple of years back now. But um, this, what we did was a particular analysis looking at, um, you know, what were the um, psychosocial work characteristics? So we talked a bit about what they already are, and you know how do they um, or do they predict uh, the turnover intentions of um, of this group in Australia? And so what what we found was um, in this group that workers' intentions to leave their jobs uh, can be influenced by um, some of those um, psychosocial work characteristics. So particularly if they didn't identify as being a caregiver, you know, that was something that, you know, that wasn't kind of really part of who they were or um, they didn't have this real sense of being a care worker, you know, they had a low kind of caring identity, especially if they had low uh, connections with other co-workers and low work enga engagement. So um, maybe the work that they were doing wasn't that meaningful. And Another uh, area was whether they had these high blurred boundaries as well. So these were kind of some key areas that um, we recognised um, uh, related to our uh, intentions to leave as well. So I suppose there's some implications there um, for what we can do and some strategies that will inform how we might go about um, um, keeping people in or um, avoiding them leaving. <laughs> So uh, now we're on to our final topic, which is the workforce um, workplace development programs. And so um, this is one of the papers that really led the program that and the, this research really around um, the systematic literature review we did. And we're really interested in um, looking at this from a multiple perspective. So looking at it from um, the uh, care worker and the organisational outcomes perspective. So we looked at... Um, um, randomized control trials. So that's kind of um, an area where there's really um, high level of control and, um, you know, is kind of tailored as being one of the gold standards of um, evidence when it comes to um, literature that, or evidence that informs uh, our programs. And, uh, and, and so we kind of chose those studies that only use that design. Um, and that and when we came to looking at uh, how many studies that looked at this topic and used that design, 
um, we've, and we looked at the programs they used, we could see that these programs that, um, in this setting that target both the organisation and the employee really looked mostly at dementia education, but they really did not look at kind of ways to help workers cope with the emotional aspects of their jobs. And so, you know, we could start to see that um, that's quite a, a gap in this kind of evidence space, if you like. And going back to um, the book chapter as well, so um, part of that, um, so the front end of this book chapter is really theory based and then at the end what we do is we uh, go back to that systematic literature review and reanalyze the, the, those studies from a different way and we looked really wanted to look really closely at resilience and what um, those um, our studies had done in relation, in relation to kind of um, resilience theory measures and um, the strategies that they had used and, and so what we found um, in that was that the strategies that they used were really you had this strengths-based approach so um, and they uh, Sometimes they would focus on uh, positive communication strategies and they would, um, you know, adopt an individual or group delivery. So there's this um, real um, sense of um, some key kind of strategies coming out in that space too. And we are, um, that review, we do, we are currently updating it as well. So. Um, we just have we're kind of halfway through updating that one, so we'll uh, keep watch on that space as well. Um, so this is another um, paper that's in preparation, and this is really um, around um, the development of the program. So this is where we conducted interviews and focus groups with um, participants who were care workers and managers, and yeah, again they could be uh, from any state or territory just in Australia. And um, most of them were aged kind of between 55 and 46 years old and mostly working in research aged care. Um, and we asked them really about some kind of a real set of questions around their jobs um, and what they thought kind of were their needs and gaps in education and training and um, in what they might like to design for a program that was looking at um, these kind of building capacity and resilience. And then once we did that, we also um, kind of showed them a description of what we kind of pieced together already, what we thought a draft of it might look like and got our feedback from those participants on that draft. Um, and particularly interested in the language we're using and whether we'd missed any gaps and, um, and we're really um, interested and keen to know about um, the way the format and delivery of the program and you know what it might what it might look like. So um, here um, we kind of one of the key kind of messages that came from that um, is that, you know, these topics around um, understanding dementia was really something that was going to be really valuable for this group. Also um, topics around communication, things around um, relationships at work and how to navigate those and the social connections at work. Um, and also um, things about raising awareness of work, worker wellbeing. These were all um, really um, well received as, as uh, key topics that could form part of an intervention by those participants. And, and then we also had um, uh, some other uh, experts involved in, in kind of reviewing some of those um, as well. So then it comes to the actual program development. <laughs> And um, so this is our, we've got a little logo together and, um, you know, uh, have, have we, in terms of the things that support the program, we have um, a, a uh, guidebook to, which really describes what the program is and um, how it's structured and the topics and tip sheets and all the things that are in it. Um, that's really intended for a facilitator to lead this program. Uh, we also, within that, there is um, educational video that we've uh, made. You might see a little famous name popping up in that video. Um, he's here today. <laughs> um, and so, and we had, we were very excited to, along the way, we had to, oh, Obviously had to adjust because this was set up to be face to face before the pandemic and how on earth are we going to do that? So we had to, you know, work out how we could do that online. And 
being at the centre where we are, we should really know how to do that well. And fortunately, we have um, some great um, other studies that are running with these online platforms. Um, one of those is called the Island Study. And there's, uh, you know, uh, this is really a Tasmanian study, which has recruited over 10,000 older adults and they're tracking, uh, tracking their um, health and well-being factors to look at how to reduce dementia risk. And so there's an incredible... Um, you know, web platform that um, has been developed for that and we were able to work really closely with our team to see well how can that apply if we wanted to deliver something like this and so we managed to create a platform <laughs> um, with what with help of from our wonderful collaborators on how to kind of deliver something like this online and uh, here are some of our contributors so who have um, been um, stars in our, our program and we invited um, interviews over Zoom and then we were um, be able to um, include some of their incredible comments about their experiences as well in the uh, program that we've delivered. So um, you can see Sarah, Sarah, as a, Sarah as a feature there and we also have um, uh, Vincent Taylor too um, from um, South Australia and Phoebe as well from New South Wales and, then, and Kate um, Johnson from um, Chiles. Um, from Tasmania and New South Wales. And, um, and we also had um, contributors in the area of um, um, Sarah Dawkins and Angela Martin as well. And so they um, have uh, are academics, but also run uh, practice in this space of um, work and mental health. And so they were able to offer some of their insights and in other areas that they worked in other um, settings as well um, and contribute to that too. And so here we have a little bit about the design of the program. Uh, so it's an online program that's de delivered um, over six weeks and it's with the workplace. So um, I mentioned it you know, has this guidebook, which is for facilitators. And so the uh, facilitator runs the program. There is this organisational preparation that happens prior to a shared practice group. And then there is some mental support for those who are essential and kind of a couple of key leaders who will take participate in both of those and be able to kind of um, bring together uh, people to the shared practice group, but also be able to provide any kind of feedback um, to the organisation, uh, which might be um, necessary, deemed appropriate by the, by the group. And so the key topic areas um, relate to exactly what I just mentioned before, so understanding dementia and workforce wellbeing, and then having these um, strengths-based approaches where um, there can be some skills that are learned or, um, uh, or shared within the group um, around um, those very topics. Um, and so, yes, there's the guidebook. Um, so there's training component of this for the facilitator as well, um, which is really largely um, uh, um, around this training, this, um, this, the guidebook uh, and the, the manual and materials as well. And so we see this program really as um, a starting point. So, um, you know, recognising that um, we're all um, promoting lifelong learning in this area and, um, and ongoing professional development is something that is that's been the challenge. So we see this as a kind of a starting point, a bit like a preparation program to um, your first touch with what these topics are and could look like. And then, um, you know, from there, kind of setting up a, um, like a structure and mechanism within the organisation to potentially continue something um, along the similar lines, or maybe it's you know something a little bit different. But um, we kind of essentially brought together people who are interested in these topics who um, might want to maintain connection with each other and uh, and kind of continue something um, kind of going on in this place um, as well. And so we look at things like. You know, we encourage that throughout the program. You're thinking ahead, and um, you know whether there are action plans that um, they, they might may like to um, address from some topics that we've covered as well. And so, with this is something we've just recently finished, which is our pilot trial. So we trialed it in two organisations, um, and this was early this year. We kind of opened it up, and we really wanted to see if this was feasible. Could it be done? <laughs> Um, and this acceptability of the, the materials that we've developed. And we were hoping to, to, to gather some data on the preliminary efficacy of the intervention. So that's where we're at, you know, reduces job stress um, and you know, enhances worker engagement, those types of things too. Um, and so, yes, it was in two aged care organisations and you can kind of see um, the structure of, you know, what we made them do, my goodness, we asked a lot, didn't we? <clears throat> 
And so um, here is a slide which really talks about, you know, again, trying to collect data from these multiple perspectives, from the managers across these kind of key areas, looking at their organisational readiness for change, collecting data around um, staffing, um, any information around um, sick leave, you know, uh, turnover that we could gather. Uh, from the care worker level, also looking at those kind of factors that inform capacity and resilience, such as psychological distress, uh, life and job satisfaction and self-efficacy as well. And then um, we also really, really wanted to involve our care recipients and their family member and, um, and looking at um, their functional ability, quality of life and satisfaction with care in particular too, and just to see if there are any kind of indirect effects that might happen. So we finished the pilot, we actually managed to do it, and I'm just so incredibly um, proud and amazed at the, the organisations for their involvement because it has been such an extremely challenging time to be taking on anything in addition to just being able to do the current work um, at, uh, that is required amidst um, the pandemic and the challenges that this sector is fa are facing. So when we started up, we had um, 119 enrolled, which was impressive. Um, but then, of course, it's, that's not the end number. <laughs> we had, um, in terms of um, those who were actually able to participate, um, overall, we had uh, 46 participants who um, were able to participate in the program. And so we suspect that's really to do with um, the big challenges that were based around um, just, you know, the, what we're trying to address with, you know, keep retaining people and managing sick leave. And um, it's just been such an incredible, incredibly challenging time in, in that. And, um, and so when we finally do get to analyse our data um, around this, we'll have much more information um, about that too. <clears throat> And so I thought I might just pop in a bit of a comment around, you know, conducting research in this space and some of the challenges around conducting this work, because I think um, it's uh, such a valuable lesson in um, being able to collect the evidence and be able to make sure that we're doing something that is informed by um, a really um, you know, you know, it has it is informed by evidence, but recognizing that it is very challenging and at this time to do that. Uh, and so some of the challenges that we were facing, you know, because the program itself is this uh, workplace program, it's not just um, in, in uh, aged care individuals, the aged care workers for individuals working across any kind of organization. How do how will we go about recruiting a whole organization? That's you know, it was a challenge we had to face. And and because we're doing this pilot, we wanted to make sure. That we need what we needed to happen to be um, two organizations that are relatively comparable as well so um and would we be able to recruit from the community setting or perhaps it would be residential aged care so we had to kind of you know again just um, see who was interested and able and um uh, and that kind of took quite a bit of time to um to just wipe that out and see who would be able to um be, be able to participate in, uh, in this kind of a program um, there's always issues with timing from the research perspective around some of those um, masses of paperwork that we really need to do but are very important because it's there to protect um, those people who are asking to participate in our programs. Um, and yeah, so along the way the pandemic happened <laughs> and so um, there was just really big challenges with um, access and isolation, um, you know, even less resources uh, with additional demands and low staffing. So, you know, we kind of proposed this prior when we thought it was challenging and now it's just so much more challenging. So how, how do we operate in that space? Um, is, 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 um, it makes it really even more important, but um, we kind of have to think things differently and I'll talk a little bit to that next. Um, the other thing that happened during this time is that you know, data is starting to kind of look and show some of this for those, particularly who are in residential aged care facilities um, who might already have um, <clears throat> uh, some kind of significant chronic condition. Really, their illness was became um, the severity increased, and um, you know, and the family member uh, distress increased as well, and and, uh, and burnout as well. So for the for the workforce, so again, that's just this the picture has just become. Um, really much more challenging, much more uh, complex as well. <clears throat> and I just um, I just in, included that picture because it's just incredible, isn't it, the, the, the links that we're trying to go to. And I think less of this is happening now where um, 
yeah, I think there were just some of the big challenges to um, the rights of older adults to be able to remain in contact with their family members. Um, and um, and but also balancing that alongside you know, protection of um, I guess illness <clears throat> and managing the pandemic. So um, you know, I have to admit too, the university sector wasn't hasn't kind of um, fared that well in the pandemic. Uh, you know, so we've also um, managed um, key personnel absences to managing the program, illness and leave. Um, there's also uh, other things going on in terms of our governance structures. Um, you know, we had to make sure we're up, um, updating protocol and making sure things. You know, uh, how we run this online. Have to really rethink things. So. Um, and then when it came to actually running it, you know, there was, we have these weather events, significant flooding occurred in some of the spaces where, when it was right at the time of um, running the program and holidays as well, um, you know, so there are just so many challenges of um, just day-to-day -day operation out there now. <laughs> so we kind of, these are some of the things that, you know, we kind of managed to cope with, which is incredible <laughs> to be able to run the program. So I'm, again, I'm just so um incredibly astounded by the fact that we got through what I wasn't really sure that would be our drop to manage to get the program run and, and I'm so grateful for those who participated. So, you know, I think what's kind of um, kept it going, gosh, um, there is so much motivation for this kind of a program. We um, have really developed some great relationships with people who are really interested in the same things that we are and, um, you know, and, you know, finding ways to support the workforce who might might not traditionally have access to the programs has kind of been, especially education and, and ongoing training and um, engaging in that kind of a space has been um, something that I think there's a lot of belief in those kind of topics and, you know, there's a big gap and a need for these kind of programs. So, um, yeah, we kind of um, recognise that there is, uh, it's, people seem to be so motivated and really ready and want that change. So we were totally had to just be flexible. And um, you know, that was flexibility was really our top priority when it came to being able to uh, get the program going. And in a research context, that's always very hard to um, remain flexible within our um with uh within our things as well. So um Sorry, I've just noticed a little message about being out of time. Are we out of time? <laughs> oh, sorry, I thought, I thought it would be a little bit longer. Okay, sorry. So look, I'll wrap it up. So yes, again, lots of constant problem solving um, and, and looking at um, a change in uh, uh, shift in mindset as to how we can feasibly get things run um, and get things done in that context. So, of course, what's next? Our pilot results, and we're looking at trying to be able to translate this into different contexts as well. So, um, if you're interested, just um, be in contact. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry I went over time, Sarah. <laughs> I didn't even mind it went down fast, but. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you, everybody. It's been just so uh, wonderful to be able to share some of the work we've done. It's, um, and, yeah, thank you so much for your time. Oh, look, thanks so much for coming along, Kate Ellen. There was so much information there. Um, just And I find it amazing that so much prior research, obviously, has gone into the research to actually produce this, this program. Um, I wanted to just quickly ask one question. Mm. If you had the ear of somebody who made all the decisions and held all the money, what would you? What would be your one recommendation? One recommendation. I think that our our aged care workers need to be valued and respected and heard and understood. Mm. <laughs> and that, yeah, we've got to do things to show that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I understand that we are out of time and people may need to go. If you would like to um, stay and ask Kate Ellen any questions you have, please do, but we won't be offended if people need to leave um, to see to other commitments. Thank you, Kate Ellen. That was great. Really interesting. <laughs> Bye, thank you. <laughs>
Yeah, that's so good. I think you have to ask them. You know, I think there's um, <clears throat> it's really important to um, have these mechanisms where there can be feedback between staff who are at the front line and managers and, you know, there's different levels of managers out there. So um, being able to have some really good, clear communication channels where um, you can express your opinion clearly and not be um, judged or valued by uh, on that. Um, so, you know, simple things like having um, anonymous staff surveys that truly are anonymous and be able to provide that space to be heard is very important. Um, I, you know, I think uh, each workplace is really different. So uh, making sure that it's, you know, kind of fits within um, that workplace uh, is part of the part of it too. But, you know, I think making kind of localised um, unique solutions appropriate for that workplace is something that, um, you know, where there's this opportunity for communication would be um, really an important part of it. I think too that um, there's something around uh, peer support or, you know, um, opportunities for developing this um, collegial connection around um, just having opportunities to share the tricks of the trade and share with each other about, um, oh gosh, you work with, um, you know, you work with Margaret today. And gosh, I saw you do such a great job with her. When I do that, it just doesn't work like that. What did you do? Or, you know, um, having the opportunity to just have those conversations and um, be able to share those things because, um, you know, we know that working with older adults really it works the best in, uh, when we have that um, interdisciplinary approach. So, um, yeah, I think providing space for that and providing time. What I thought was really valuable about the pilot program that we with Work for Dementia was if we provide the slower space for the staff to come and share their experiences of work. And that just really, you know, is um, difficult to get in those contexts where they're very task focused and very, um, <clears throat> you know, have to just meet those really key and very important needs, uh, you know, of, um, of um, addressing addressing a wound or redressing a wound or, you know, whatever that is. But I think that there is real value in providing space for um, reflection and uh, opportunity where you're in your, not just learning information, but you're reflecting sharing it with someone else as to how you would apply it <clears throat> I think yeah I think that's probably quite true I've sort of been reflecting on um my time when I worked on a ward like an age psych ward and in one environment all the staff took staggered breaks the nursing floor staff took staggered breaks yeah. and in the other one everyone took a break together which initially I was like this is weird but then it sort of got a chance for you to do basically almost at the end of the shift to go, well, how about that then? You know? <laughs> yes, yes. And that really informal, terrible, you don't, very non-PC conversation, but it's that venting space amongst yourselves. And then you go back on the floor and you finish your notes. And, yep. you know, and But that was just a structure that existed. And yeah. you know, I hadn't thought about the fact that in the workplace I came from before that, that that didn't exist. Mm. Because you don't, you don't have time in your day if you are working in that type of environment to do that organically always yeah. and that's a very good point and then you're talking about the people who are working in the community as carers in people's homes and you know they would barely even know the other people doing the same roles as them let alone have a chance to share with them so it's really interesting how that needs yeah. to be prioritized and I guess if you're going to be able to prioritize for those people to meet and share that's more money you know, at some point, somebody's going to have to pay for that because that's time. So, yeah, like most things, you can fix things with more money sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. That, that's what I was going to ask, Steph and Kate. In your research, Kate, um, has the financial impact been mentioned? I haven't sort of heard th that throughout this topic, but the pay rates and the lack of them in some <clears throat> areas been part of anyone's uh, responses? Oh, yes. Um, so, um, Sometimes it is, but, you know, there's some really good um, research around, um, what is it? Oh, it's, I can't think of it. It's got such a catchy title. Um, we're not in it for the money or we're in it for love and not money or something. Mm -hmm. You know, it's something like that, you know. And um, I think 
I think pre-pandemic and pre-Royal Commission, you know, um, that's when that was. And I think now it's really getting to the point where, um, you know, we do hear a lot more um, dissatisfaction with um, with pay and um, yeah. around that too. And, um, yeah, and I, I think um, when you look at how, you, how um, society values work, um, that financial remuneration is part of that, isn't it? You know, Absolutely. There's, yeah. there's been some really interesting comments. Um, I was watching, what was it, the drum? Was that last night? There was um, some really, um, was a, a topic around aged care workforce um, on that. And um, there were some really great comments around, mm. um, around that too. So. Because I think doing it for the love of it or for the, you know, only gets to a point. And I think that sometimes it kind of, then it can break. And and when you're getting all the stresses and, and no financial benefits, say, at the end, it's yeah. kind of, that can only last you so far, I think. I don't know if I'm wrong in saying yeah. that, but <laughs> it's just kind of like what I've, yeah, seen. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. Isn't it? And that's that precarious nature of the resilience, I think, that we're trying to really highlight in this space that yeah um something now's the time <laughs> now's the time absolutely and, yeah and i think it's been um just incredible to see um kind of a shift in um really our attitudes or awareness of our attitudes towards aging as well because i think the aged care workforce is also you know reflected in that the stigma associated with that you know so um yeah i think there's a lot of um interesting um, change happening at the moment and uh, hopefully a lot more to come. Thanks so much. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you again, Kate Allen. It's been an absolute pleasure listening to you this afternoon. Thanks so much, Sarah. And sorry I just rabbit it on. I could... That's all <laughs> right. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So the, 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 video, the, the video that you referred to the, yourself and Sarah in, is that available somewhere to us to watch? Not at the moment. So um, uh, it's it, because that's part of the program and we're still just com coming together to finish up our um, results for the program. So our first step is getting through those results and then we can feed it back to the sites and then we're hopeful to have like a launch or something. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, where we're able to um, have the resources available. Cool. No worries. Excellent. Keep our eyes peeled. Yes, that's right. Thanks very Thank much. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Kate Ellen. That was great. I'm sorry I had to cut you off. That's all right, Nora. I'm so glad I saw your, your little note there. <laughs> um, I never know, um, you know, whether to go like this or... <laughs> no, but, yeah, we try and keep it to the hour so yes. people can fit it in. Yeah, I don't know where yeah. I saw in my mind, but um, oh, was happy. We, we got there in the MC. <laughs> we, we did. We did. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks very much, Kate. <laughs> See you. Bye. 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 <laughs> There's a lot of info. It was good. Oh, we're still recording. Yeah. Why can I never find it? <laughs>